are the facts because the facts are difficult for them to face. The objective fact is that Manhattan has instituted pro-crime anti-victim policies that have resulted in an increase in violent crime and created this dangerous situation in the community. And, and one, America's once great cities that was the symbol of freedom and opportunity and liberty. Mm -hmm. According to the NYPD data, New York City saw a 23% surge in major crimes in one year mm -hmm. since Alvin Bragg took over. That is the fact. We have a violent crime epidemic here, and everybody in America knows it because we see the videos played mm -hmm. out on our television, mm -hmm. local news, every single night of what's going on here in the city. I just want to say this, and I, I'm almost out of time, but I, I've shared in this committee before the long list of statements from leading Democrats in Congress and the leading Democrats on this very committee who specifically and aggressively called for the defunding of the, of the police. And as a result, in 2020, in New York City, officials cut $1 billion from the police department's 2021 budget. These are the completely foreseeable and obvious effects of these soft on crime policies that are advanced by Soros-funded DAs. Alvin Bragg is, in my view, probably the worst offender. And they're trying to manipulate the facts. They're trying to change it. But I thank you all for being here. I yield the remainder of my time. It will be in order. If the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff, is recognized for five minutes. Almost three weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, is the microphone on? Sure. Yeah, just pull it close. Okay. Almost three weeks ago, Donald J. Trump was indicted by a grand jury in Manhattan on dozens of counts of fraud in connection with a hush money payment scheme in which his personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, previously went to jail. Since the former president's indictment, the Manhattan District Attorney has been the subject of countless death threats and racist diatribes. Others have made ugly appeals to anti-Semitism in an effort to attack the proceedings. And this committee, this committee has used every means at its disposal to disrupt, interrupt, and interfere with the prosecution, demanding documents it has no right to obtain and no jurisdiction to demand, subpoenaing a former district attorney, deputy district attorney, and threatening to subpoena the DA, DA himself, and now holding this hearing in Manhattan in a vain attempt to intimidate or embarrass the prosecutorial authority. Now, the majority denies that this is the purpose of today's hearing. They would have you believe it is a mere coincidence that all of a sudden and out of the blue, the chairman decided that the state of New York is a wonderful place to do a hearing. Not the chairman's home state of Ohio with its high rates of murder, but New York State. And of all the cities in New York, they would pick New York City. And of all the boroughs in New York, they pick Manhattan. Apparently, Manhattan is just lovely this time of year. What a remarkable coincidence we are meant to believe of all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world, we just happen to walk into this one. How absurd. Of course, this is not a coincidence at all. Instead, it is the GOP leadership in Congress doing what it has done best for the last six years, and that is to act as the criminal defense counsel for Donald J. Trump. Well, let me tell you this, let me tell you this. Capitol Police, gentlemen, will suspend. Capitol Police, Cap Capitol Police will remove let, the gentleman let, from the audience. Let me tell you this, gentlemen, let me gentlemen, tell you this. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Donald J. Trump. Gentlemen, will suspend. So we got order. Gentlemen, will suspend. The audience has to be that has to be in order. Capitol, Capitol Police, Capitol Police, sir. Can we have order? We are working on it, Mr. Mr. Schiff, gentlemen. Capitol Police, please, please remove the gentleman from the audience. No, you got to go. You got to go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've given you several warnings. You got to go, unfortunately. That was a very unfortunate attempt, attack on Ralph Nader.
<laughs> committee will be in order. Committee will be in order. The gentleman uh, from California. His comments is about Ralph Nader are way out of line. Um, <laughs> of course, it is not a coincidence that we are here in Manhattan. Instead, it is the GOP leadership in Congress doing what it has done best over the last six years, and that is to act as the criminal defense counsel for Donald J. Trump. Well, let me tell you this. Donald Trump doesn't need the lawyers on this committee to be his criminal defense lawyer. He has plenty of those already. Nor is that the role of Congress. Quite the opposite. Our role should be to defend the rule of law, not tear it down. We should be defending the principle that no one is above the law, not attempting to establish a new principle that if you are politically powerful enough, you get a pass. We should be defending the independence of the grand jury and the safety of a public servant enforcing the law, not adding to the dangers to both. The Manhattan District Attorney has the burden of proving Donald Trump guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A jury of ordinary citizens will have the responsibility of determining whether he has met that burden. That this process will be the same for a former president as it would be for his lawyer or his driver or his doorman or his neighbor is the strength of a democracy, not its weakness. The first thing Chairman Jordan said today was that this hearing is about the administration of justice. But more accurately, it is about an effort to interfere with the administration of justice. He said that here in Manhattan, the scales of justice are being weighed down by politics, and they are, but only today. And by this committee's actions in trying to intimidate the Manhattan DA for having the audacity to believe that in America, being rich, being powerful, even being president of the United States, does not entitle you to violate the law with impunity. There was a time in America when both parties used to believe in the rule of law. But sadly, those days are over. One of America's two great political parties believes that political might makes right. And more than right, it means that you are beyond the reach of the law and beyond accountability. The more power, the less justice. But this is not democracy. This is the antithesis of democracy. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of our witnesses being here today. Thank you for sharing your compelling stories. Um, I, I would just say, Mr. Morgan, after hearing what you've heard today, I think you probably understand why it's real tough to sit down and have a logical, cogent argument on how we might jointly with nonpartisan affiliation try to solve some of these problems. What do you think? And, and talks about you guys, Republicans, about Trump. Hey, he was in, while Trump was in office, he's busy holding hearings trying to get him out for four years. So I don't, I don't think you have the right to say that you, you politicized when you were in power. You tried to get Trump out. You couldn't get him out. Let's face reality. You tried. The dossier was a fake. Everything what it was. You tried to get him. He's sitting there laughing. That's, that's very nice. And the other Democrats are telling us that we're all props for sitting there. Please don't talk down to us. It's Thank really not nice. Thanks, yes. Mr. Borg. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I wanted to, to just uh, just uh, read some. These are not these are not by a Republican. These aren't from Republican members of this committee. These are these are just comments here. Um, this is this is what uh, an individual said. Said I would add that you know it's not so much from necessarily federal funding, but it's something that I do want to spend more time on and focus on and use the the plight. I mean, use the pulpit representing the district in public safety. I think a lot of people walk around the city very scared right now. And the violent crime wave is very concerning. This individual also said, I think people are scared to go on the subway in the whole district. I've heard it from all over the place, from the wealthy, the wealthy areas in Tribeca, to Chinatown, to Borough Park, to Sunset Park. I think a lot of people are afraid. He also said, I'm very concerned about the safety in the city. He also said, I've been part of this community defending the victims and trying to protect the public for my whole career. And I think that those experiences resonate with people in different ways for different reasons, close quote. We cannot allow people to just continue to cycle through the system because it's demoralizing to the cops and it gives everyone a perception of danger. He also said, 
whether or not the data says that it's safe or not, there is a perception in the city that it is not safe, and one of the reasons for that is the perpetual recidivism that is going on, close quote. He also said, quote, you've got people randomly being shot on the subways. You've got people randomly being thrown into car trucks and driven to remote places and shot. There's an insecurity not felt in 25 years. It's scary to me and far away the number one issue, close quote. It didn't come from anybody on this side of the aisle. It didn't even come from any of you at the table. It came from Mr. Goldman over there. We sit in his district. He knows that there's a crime problem. And we've been hearing about a study. Um, let, me, let me refer you to the heritage study that my colleague referred to, and I ask that it's addition. Without objection. Thank you. Quote, when you remove the crime-infested, homicide-riddled cities from the state murder rate featured in the Third Way study, which was co-authored by Mr. Kessler, you dramatically lower the murder rate for that state, upending their conclusions, his conclusions, and exposing the piece for what it really is, a straightforward attempt at political projection dressed up as a study. That's what you've been hearing about to rebut the stories and the facts of the lives of the victims and the witnesses and those who live in this city today. Mr. Holden, why won't your family go take the subway, the, the mass transit system in this, in this uh, city? What, what they've experienced when my daughter took the subway the other day for the first time, she says, I'm not going back because I felt unsafe. I, I just, people talking to themselves, people screaming. Uh, it is terrible. And by the way, if you want to cherry pick uh, numbers uh, from the other side, and I'm a Democrat, but I'm against what I've heard about uh, these stats. Two, uh, downloaded from the NYPD this morning, 25% increase in all the seven major crimes in New York City in, the, in a two-year period. 26% in the 13-year period for Manhattan North, Manhattan South, 59% increase in a two-year period in the seven major crimes, 17% uh, in the 13-year period. For all of New York City, and this again is from NYPD, so cherry pick your own numbers, but this is overall. 45% increase in the two-year period in crime, in the seven major crimes, and a 23% in the 13-year. So this is what we're facing, and this is what we go to work, and we fought so hard in the 90s to stop this crime wave that we had in New York City, and we did it. But now it's being rolled back to the bad old days. Yield back. I think the gentleman, gentleman yields back. Let me just, before going to Mr. Cicilline, um We've been at it this two hours. Are the witness is fine. If any, it, can you? Because we'll keep going. If, but if you need a break, just please let us know. The gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield 30 seconds to Mr. Goldman from New York. I appreciate Mr. Biggs' reference to some of the concerns that uh, we have about public safety because it is something that is shared across the aisle. The problem is that you are using this as a political stunt, unrelated to real concerns about public safety around this country. Manhattan has the sixth fewest murders out of the top 50 cities in this country. So we all know why you're here. So don't play the political games. You want to have a meaningful conversation? Let's talk. I yield back. Uh, I want to thank uh, the witnesses for being here today and, of course, sharing uh, some very painful stories about your loss. Uh, I want to start by emphasizing that keeping Americans safe is one of the most, if not the most important responsibilities that we have in government. Uh, it's one of our most important callings as lawmakers. And I was mayor of a city and presided over the lowest crime rate in 30 years, serving as a public safety commissioner. So I understand this very deeply. Uh, but my colleagues, sadly, are not here to meaningfully work on public safety solutions. This hearing was called for a purpose, to intimidate a district attorney for doing his job and upholding the rule of law. And you know how I know this? Because... Our colleagues consistently vote against laws that would increase public safety and ignore facts on what actually decreases crime. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death of children in America. And it kills 40,000 Americans a year. I mean, it would be in order. And yet my colleagues... The gentleman suspend him just for a second. I'd ask that the clock stop, yes, please. Yes, clock stop. We'd we'll be happy to do that. We need to stop the conversations over here. Uh, the, the gentleman... We, gentleman
gentleman deserves to be heard. The, the committee uh, guests will please refrain from talking and chatting so that Mr. Cicilline can make his presentation and ask his questions. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death of children in America and kills 40,000 Americans a year. Yet my colleagues vote repeatedly against even the most common sense gun violence prevention measures. They vote against getting assault weapons off the streets, despite the previous assault weapons ban that drastically reduced gun violence. They vote against alerting people to active shooters. They vote against safe storage and red flag laws. They vote against community-based crime prevention programs. They vote against background checks. And the list goes on and on. And more than that, they brought us here today to attack a district attorney who has actually seen a decrease in violent crime during his tenure, all because he dared to hold Donald Trump accountable. So please spare me this suggestion that this is about a sincere interest in finding solutions to crime. This is about your agenda to earn the admiration and support and good wishes of the former President of the United States. But I, for one, would actually like to hear about some actual solutions to public safety, and particularly to gun violence in our communities. And that brings me to my first question. Ms. Fisher, how uh, do our gun laws, or lack thereof, contribute to America's gun violence epidemic? And is the rate of gun violence in this country and the rate of gun death comparable in any other developed country in the world? Thank you, Representative. Uh, the gun violence rate in the United States is 26 times higher than every other high-income country. So we are comparatively a much more dangerous place to live. And though violent crime, and I strongly uh, push forward that gun violence is violent crime and should be considered as a part of this hearing, Violent crime is going down in New York City according to law enforcement's own data. However, we could be doing so much more to ensure that New Yorkers are protected and all Americans are protected by enacting comprehensive universal backgrounds checks, by having a licensing system and requiring a permit to purchase. We could also be banning the assault weapons, assault weapons that are most commonly used in mass shootings that are killing our children every day. And one of the things that I think that Congress has a responsibility to look at, although we don't have jurisdiction over state criminal prosecutions, obviously, or local prosecutions, what uh, is the evidence with respect to the focus on exclusively arrest and incarceration, but how do we prevent crimes? What are the good strategies? Because, frankly, by the time someone's a victim of a crime, we've already failed. Our goal should be to prevent crime. So what does the evidence say with respect to those two different strategies? We need to be investing in prevention, largely because there's so many guns that are being trafficked from out of state. We need to be investing in our communities, and that's with resources towards community violence intervention strategies and prevention programs, including in schools, more trauma support for victims, more resources, better housing, all of those issues in terms of the inequities that are impacting especially impoverished black and brown communities in this country and in this city need to be addressed as a public health crisis, and we need to be investing in prevention. Thank you. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman, Ms. Tiffany is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, um, would you rather have sympathy for the police, or would you rather have respect from elected leaders? Well, respect and sympathy. Uh, it's a very difficult time, time in uh, my 40 years now. This is probably the most difficult time in policing that I've ever seen. But, uh, yeah, you know, respect is important, of course. Do soft on crime policies lead to less gun violence? I believe so, yes. So you believe going soft on crime is going to cause there to be less gun violence in your city? No, not less. Soft on crime is going to cause more gun violence. Today. Okay, I'll state it this way then. Does, do soft on crime policies lead to more gun violence? Yes. Ms. Harrison and Ms. Brain. The ranking member said this city is safer. 
Is this city safer in your mind, Ms. Harrison? No, I have a lot of friends through my advocacy that live here that are considering moving <coughs> their entire families. Ms. Brame, is this city safer under District Attorney Bragg? Absolutely not. There's all kinds of criminal elements roaming the street, free to do whatever they want. Mr. Holden, the district attorney's office conceded they use $5,000 in federal funds, which are authorized by us here, um, for purposes other than fighting violent crime here in Manhattan. Do you agree with the district attorney's decision to do that? No, I don't. And uh, I, I disagree with most of what uh, DA Bragg's uh, is about, uh, especially the soft on crime. But what, what ha what's happened in New York City, the reason why our crime, and it's not going down, it's going up, if you look at the, the trends, um, we have the lowest incarceration rate of any major city in the United States. I'll, I'll repeat that. The lowest incarceration rate of, let's say, 40 of the biggest cities, New York, New York City has the lowest. And that's because Mayor de Blasio, uh, before Mayor Adams, started releasing everyone from jail. So, of course, crime was going to go up, and it skyrocketed in 2020. So what, that's the reason. We still, I believe, we have to arrest more people, and this, uh, D.A. Bragg will disagree, and, and they should go to jail when they commit a crime. So, Mr. Holden, in regards to the – so there's this federal funding that comes in and it's not being used for, to fight violent crime. Is it – you know, as an elected representative, do you view it as inappropriate that those of us that are responsible for those dollars going to fighting crime using federal funds, is it imp inappropriate for us to review how those dollars are being spent? Yes, it, it certainly we should review it, yes. Mr. Holden, have you been asked to be on any of the major networks to deliver your message? Have you been asked, for example, to be on CNN to deliver your message? Uh, I, I've been asked not from CNN, but I have been asked uh, on other major networks, yes. And you've shared those comments. Ms. Bray, Ms. Yeah. Harrison, have you been asked to be on one of the major networks to tell your story? Not CNN. Ms. Harrison. No, not CNN, not MSNBC. They refuse to even acknowledge that victims are a part of this hearing. So let's, let's talk about, we hear percentages. Time after time we're hearing percentages. In 2022, as a result of a 7% increase in rapes, that's 110 more people that I got raped here in New York City. Those are almost all women, I'm sure. 110 people. Auto theft. 3,256 more carjackings here in New York as a result of this soft on crime. Transit crimes, people being pushed off from subways, right? 521 more people. 521 more people, 30% more? That's 521 more people. That's what we're seeing, ladies and gentlemen. These are real people that are being harmed. I just wanna conclude with this, Mr. Chairman. I'm so glad we're having this first hearing in New York, but I want you to come to my state. I want you to come to Milwaukee, where we had a district attorney. Here's his quote when he started out. Is there going to be an individual I divert or put into a treatment program who's going to go out and kill somebody? <coughs> you bet. Milwaukee has 10% of the population, and they have 25% of the crime. Mr. Kessler, that's the problem, is the Soros prosecutors are not doing their job. And in Wisconsin, now we've got a Soros Supreme Court justice. The people of Wisconsin better hang on because violent crime is going to get worse. Come to Milwaukee, Mr. Chairman, for the next hearing. Gentlemen's time's expired. Ms. Scanlon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our constituents elect us to make their lives better. They send us to Washington to work on the issues that impact American families, whether it's health care, jobs, the cost of prescription drugs, infrastructure, clean air and water, climate rescue, and of course, safe communities and schools. But every day in Congress, we are seeing the right-wing extremists who control the House failing all of us choosing publicity over progress, choosing politics over people, and choosing protecting the disgraced and now indicted former president rather than protecting our democracy. 
Today, at the urging of the former president and his lawyers, the chairman has dragged the entire House Judiciary Committee to New York, inserting the federal government into a purely state and local matter with no credible pretense of jurisdiction. And he's making the American taxpayer, and especially the New Yorkers, who he claims to be so concerned about, making those taxpayers pay for this foolishness. This isn't governance. It's not working for the American people. It's grandstanding. It's a stunt. Just look at all the cameras here. And every second of it is preventing us from being able to do the real work that the people who elected us expect us to do in Congress. To our witnesses here today who've shared their pain and trauma in being victims of crime and violence, I am so sorry for the impact that has had on you and your families. Anyone listening to you has to be moved by what you've experienced. And I applaud your courage in trying to take that pain and move to change things going forward. But I fear that you have been re-victimized by this hearing because this hearing is not going to provide that change. It's not a serious effort to make our communities safer. Our Republican colleagues aren't in New York City to prevent crime. They're here to protect someone who's been charged with committing crimes. And how do we know that? Look at the time, place, and manner of this hearing. We know that the timing isn't a coincidence because as soon as it became obvious that the Manhattan District Attorney was getting ready to charge Mr. Trump with crimes, Mr. Trump's lawyers sent a letter to the chairman telling him to use the full powers of Congress to go after the Manhattan DA. We know that the place is important because the choice of place for this hearing isn't a coincidence. It's about protecting Mr. Trump because it's being held in the city where Mr. Trump was indicted and arrested just two weeks ago. If this hearing were focused on fighting crime, as several people have mentioned, there are other jurisdictions that have much higher rates of crime. And, if this, and as to the manner of this hearing, we know that it's about protecting Mr. Trump because it's being led by the disgraced former president's closest allies, the ones who benefit the most if he can beat the criminal charges here in New York or if they can intimidate the Manhattan DA or the other prosecutors across the country who are investigating other alleged crimes. Crime prevention is a serious topic and it deserves serious discussion. But that's not what this hearing is about. Instead, we're seeing a circus, a performance by partisan politicians who've hitched their wagons to the Trump train. So I and my colleagues refuse to sit idly by while families across this country, from Alabama to Louisville to Nashville to Uvalde to Buffalo to Boulder, while they're mourning the loss of their loved ones to gun violence, we stand ready to pass legislation to address the serious issues facing all Americans if our Republican colleagues will let us. Now, Ms. Fisher, you and several others have mentioned the Iron Pipeline, the route through which many of the crime guns in states like New York and Pennsylvania are acquired. Just last year, the ATF intercepted 400 illegal guns from southern states that were being sent to my community in Philadelphia. Can you speak to the impact of lax gun laws in states that um, lack more um, specific gun laws, the impact that it has on gun violence is in cities like New York and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia? Absolutely. Thank you, Representative. Um, because uh, traffickers are able to easily and illegally obtain guns um, in states with weak gun laws like Florida or Georgia or the Carolinas, um, they are able to easily purchase lots of guns and traffic them into neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by structural and systemic inequities for decades. Um, and we're talking about um, vulnerable communities that are already lacking in access to resources. 
Um, and because of that, those guns are being used um, in crimes and also because gun carrying is more likely when people feel afraid and, um, ladies, and, and they're ladies. feeling more powerful. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Uh, Chairman, ladies. I would just seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a report entitled Uncovering the Truth About Pennsylvania Crime Guns. Without objection. Thank you. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Mr. Good Chairman, I'm sorry. They keep addressing us, the victims who are here to testify and make change. We're here to effectuate J change if and then not allow us to comment at all. Just for a second, Ms. Harrison. Mr. I'm sure Mr. Gooden will give you a chance to respond, but time belongs now to Mr. Gooden. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Brame, I heard you saying how disrespectful this was. I share your concerns, but we're going to come back to you, but I'd first like to yield to the chairman. Oh, that's fine. Go, I'll, I'll yield. Go to Ms. Harrison. You, you know, Ms. Brame, I I'm, I'm disgusted with what I'm seeing. This is, this is a serious event. We've called you all in here to share your experience. Um, we've been called jackbooted thugs uh, by the opposing party for having this hearing. Uh, it's been called foolishness. I don't believe your stories are foolish. Um, we've heard from the congressman that represents this district just six months ago who said, quote, you've got people randomly being shot on the subways. You've got people randomly being thrown into car trunks and driven to remote places and shot. There's an insecurity not felt here in 25 years, end quote. If the local congressman is saying that, then I don't believe you all are crazy for saying the same things. Mm -hmm. And I thank you all for being here. Uh, Ms. Brame, you've shared so much and we, we thank you. Um, is there any, any further comments you'd like to have? Uh, we hear all the talk about the former president from the mm -hmm. other side. Um, but this is not a political hearing, uh, despite claims from the other side, and I give you the floor. The only people I hear talking about politics or President Trump is from the other side. I don't hear no one, I don't hear any of these victims, I don't hear anyone else talking about President Trump except from the people from the other side, from the other side of where? The other side of the moon, the other side of the world, the other side. Whatever that is. Let me tell you something. Victims can care less about anyone's political ideology or party. Neither do criminals. They don't go up to a person and ask them if they're Democrat or Republican before they bust them in the head, okay? Or before they push them in front of a train. Or before they, they stab them to death. These are real life people that we're dealing with. We pay you guys. Our tax dollars pay you. You work for us. We do not work for you. The committee will be in order. The committee will be in order. Oh, belongs to the gentleman from Texas. Ms. Brame, I, I want to thank you again. And while the other side wants you to stop talking, I hope you'll continue mm -hmm. uh, well after Absolutely. today. And thank Absolutely. You, thank you. I'll uh, yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Well, I was just going to say, Ms. Harrison, are you grandstanding? No, and it, it seems like, you know, as Madeline mentioned, the, the other side is here on taxpayer dollars. The least that they could do is listen to our side of it, ask us questions. They brought witnesses in to counter our har horrific stories for their agenda. All they want to do is talk about gun legislation. Well, you can have all the gun legislation on the books, but if it's not enforced, which is what Alvin Bragg is doing, then it's not going to matter and people are going to die. And that's why we're here. And I appreciate your oversight because we do need help. And if they continue to ignore it, people are going to continue to die. Is this committee victimizing you, Ms. Brame, as Democrats said? Absolutely not. This committee is, has given me a platform, has given me a seat at the table to be able to tell my story and raise awareness for victims all over not just New York City, but all over this country, especially from Philadelphia. Ms. Fisher, if, if, if the guns are the problem, why didn't the Democrats fix it? The Democrats have worked hard to pass comprehensive. Well, they had control. They controlled all the House, all the Senate. The guy, they still have the White House. Why didn't they fix it last Congress? We if need the answer is, comprehensive if, gun violence prevention legislation to be passed, and this Congress has the ability and the capacity to do that. I was in the Congress last uh, last session. Mr. So Nader was the chair. They now. tried, but they, didn't, they could have passed. They didn't pass we it. We need Congress to go back to would Washington and pass strong Mr. gun violence prevention legislation. No, I'm going to go to Mr. DiGiacomo. Mr. DiGiacomo, uh, are, are, are you grandstanding? Not at all. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm You're here, here representing the detectives of this great town, right? Absolutely, and very proud of it. 
I, I am not here other than to ask for help. Someone just said that we can't do anything here. Well, if the people of the United States Congress can't do anything to help us, we're in a lot of trouble because there are some powerful people around this table that could help and stop the violence and make the streets safer for the people of New York City and the police officers and, and detectives that serve them. Thank you. Uh, we're here for help. Thank we you. We need help. I thank the gentleman from uh, Texas, and uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Could the gentlelady yield for a moment? Yes, Mr. Nadler. Thank you. I just want to answer uh, Mr. Jordan's question. Last year, when we were in control, the Democrats in the House passed very comprehensive gun control legislation. The Democrats in the Senate voted for very comprehensive gun control legislation, but because of the filibuster, you needed 60 votes, and we got no Republican votes, and that's why it didn't pass. I, I, I thank the gentlelady. I yield back. I echo the, the, the uh, statistics that were just offered by the ranking member, Mr. Nadler. Democrats have been working to reduce crime, to reduce gun violence, crime, uh, wherever we can. And let me say, everyone, I believe everyone in this room has sympathy for the horrific stories, the horrific losses of life, the horrific attacks, the anti-Semitic attacks, on, attack on your son. We have great sympathy. Uh, we hear you. You are properly raising your voices. Don't let anything that we have to say indicate that we don't think you should be lifting your voices. But there is an underlying sham going on here. I know you don't like to hear it. Your voices are important, but two things can be true at the same time. We are not properly here. It is not our jurisdiction to oversee or to interfere with an independent district attorney's office. We are not properly here. This is not our jurisdiction. I wish None of us are that, asking that, you to excuse interfere. Me. That lady controls the time. It is proper that you raise your voices, but it is hypocritical that we are here. If this committee wants to do something about violence in this country, about the horrific losses of life, do something. Work on legislation with us. This weekend, two more mass shootings. Is that calling your attention? Are you up in arms to say what in God's name can we do to reduce the slaughter of our children? Your children, our children. It's the third Monday of April, and so far this year, more than 5,000 people have been killed by gun violence. Another 9,200 caught in the crossfire. Nearly 500 children and teenagers have died because of rampant gun violence. We know that number of families devastated and lives forever altered is even larger. And we're only in the fourth month. None of this is new. Hearing after hearing, one Congress to the next, the numbers keep repeating themselves. More than 200 people a day shot. 40,000 people a year killed by guns. We know all this. Facts are supposed to influence action. Horrifying facts are supposed to elicit a response. Yet my Republican colleagues prefer gesturing about violent crime rather than doing something about it. I'm reminded of uh, the character in succession, the late Logan Roy said, you are not serious people. If you are serious about doing something about violence, gun violence, and other violence, please join us. Last Congress, as the uh, ranking member said, the House passed a universal background checks bill. 63% of Republican gun owners support it, yet only eight of my Republican colleagues supported the bill. 202 of them voted against it, including every Republican member in this room. Again, not serious people. Assault weapons are the firearm of choice in mass shootings. The Democratic House last Congress voted to ban these weapons of war. Only two Republicans out of 211 voted for it. Neither is in this room today. When Senate Republicans were finally motivated to, act to action by the horrific slaughter of babies in Uvalde, did my Republican colleagues here join? No, not a single one of them voted for the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Make no mistake, if the concern about addressing violent crime uh, addressed by my Republican colleagues was genuine, they would have acted. 
there'd be more for us to be talking with you about here. We're only here today because Chairman Jordan and his colleagues want to make a show of defending a former failed, twice impeached, crooked president. This is not serious. Violent crime is a grave national issue. It demands serious consideration by legislators who want to make a difference and to save lives. That is reserved for us. I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Goodman. Goodman. Can I ask you, why, not, why is anybody blaming the shooter? You're always blaming guns. No one blames the shooter. They're crazy people. Committee, committee will be in order. No Mr. Borgen, the committee will be in order. The, the gentlelady had, I believe, like 18 seconds. And you were yielding to was it Mr. Goldman? Yes. The gentleman's recognized. I, I want to be very clear to all of you, as reflected in my statements, that we are all very, very concerned about your stories. We are concerned about every victim. I was a prosecutor for 10 years. Victims' rights are essential. But what we're talking about here is something that the state needs to deal with. The reason why we're saying this is a political theater is that we don't have jurisdiction to do anything about what you're General concerned ladies, about. General so ladies. I just want you to understand that. General ladies, time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Benz. Pull that real close, Cliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you, witnesses, for being here and sharing with us your incredibly challenging stories. Uh, quote, the justice system's not cooperating this is a quote from the, uh, one of the retailers here in your town. The justice system is just not cooperating. It's getting to a point where you either have to padlock every item that has to be stolen or could be stolen, or you have to fight back. And if you fight back, you take the risk of going to jail for protecting your property. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. we're here. Here's, here's several more because I've heard a lot of suggestions that we're here for reasons having nothing to do with why, why I'm here. This has 8.5 million people. That's just twice what my state has. It has 58 million people within 250 miles. It is 4 million larger than our next largest city, which would be L. It has a GDP of $1.56 trillion. This is an asset we should be doing everything to protect, and particularly the people within it. Mr. Holden, drawing your attention to the next to last paragraph in your testimony, it appears that you believe that we in Congress can actually do something. You actually talk about what we might do. Uh, and, and so I would like you just to elaborate just a bit so that people aren't thinking that we're just here for show. We can actually do something. Can you go to that next to last paragraph and share your thoughts? Yes. When um, the public is not being protected, when we fear for our safety day in and day out, we, have, we lose our freedom. And if Congress can't do something, then I don't think anyone can. We, you can. You can do this with funding. You can do this with... Um, certainly federal attorneys jumping in, prosecutors. There's a lot of things I think Congress can do. I'm here because, and as a Democrat, I don't agree with a lot of my party's stances on things, but, uh, and I'm more of an independent person. But I've, in, I've been on six years in the city council, and they've never held a hearing on victims' rights. Mm. They hold... They hold hearings on criminal rights and how they're not being treated properly. And I get that. That's important to have. But what about victims' rights? I, six years on the city council, on the public safety committee, not one hearing. Mr. Hull, I'm going to interrupt, if I may. I want, I'm going to stick with you, though, because you also say in your letter, and this is a response to Ranking Member Nadler's questions about percentages and crime reduction, but you note in your testimony about cherry-picking of statistics. So I want you to talk about that for just a second. You note that, uh, that it's easy to twist these numbers around. And I'm kind of reminded about something that was said a little earlier, that it's easy to focus on percentages, but we should be focusing on the real numbers, as Mr. Tiffany pointed out, the thousands when we talk about percentages as, as though it's meaningless. Tell me what you, what you say yeah, in your that's letter. A, that's a real thing because I have businesses, and I have one individual who owns four gas stations in my district, and he's from Southeast Asia. He's an immigrant. He uh, is living the American dream until recently, until 2019 when the bail reform package went through the state. Uh, he says a good day for me and my four gas stations when, I, uh, when I'm not held up. We consider it a good day. He's losing two or $3,000 a day in the four gas stations with petty theft and being held up. It's a serious issue. And I, we fought to get crime. We had 17 straight years in New York City of crime reduction up 
until 2019 when they pushed the bail reform and discovery through the state. And now crime is going up. And again, 13 years we've had an increase in crime. So anybody cherry picking those numbers, anybody who's a real New Yorker knows that we had low crime and we were proud of that. We were the safest city in the United States, not anymore. Thank you. The, the, uh, uh, the, we're, we're just a few seconds left. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm happy we're here in New York. But for those of you who want to see the consequences of lax uh, prosecution practices, come to Portland, Oregon. Mm. And, and look at what's happened to that beautiful city where I went to law school years ago. And you can wander around in downtown Portland without fear of, of anything happening. The restaurants were great. The cultural scene was great. In the last three years, that has changed so dramatically. It is ridiculous. And if you, if you want to see what happens when you don't prosecute people for throwing bricks through windows, starting fires in downtown, running everybody else out, come to Portland. It's, a, it's a so incredibly sad. And, but I'm going to come back to New York for a moment. My last little phrase here is, despite what you folks are enduring here as a result of runaway progressivism, uh, you still uh, have these wonderful people, the police working for you, and I'm happy for that. But I tell you, as I sit here and listen to Democrat politicians use rampant crime and violence to justify more restrictions on possession of firearms, I must say, please, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's turn our attention to the good things we can do in Congress. And, and with that, I, uh, I thank you all and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, just a brief response to that. I mean, uh, yes, we're thinking about gun control and trying to reduce gun violence because of Nashville and Louisville and uh, Alabama yesterday. So um, it seems to me that it's unsustainable. We need to do something to address it. Um, I, you know, I believe the Second Amendment is important, but I think protecting second graders from being killed is important as well. Uh, Ms. Harris and Ms. Brame, Mr. Borgen, I, I want to commend you. Uh, I was a prosecutor for 12 years, uh, four as a federal prosecutor, eight as a local prosecutor uh, in Maryland, which is kind of the birthplace of, of the victims' rights movement. And so I understand that um, th what you're doing and the role that you play, uh, in, in fact, it really transformed the criminal justice system in the 90s and, and the 2000s, and I, I encourage you to continue on. I, you don't need that. I can tell just by what I've heard from you today, you're going to sustain it and keep fighting on behalf of your um, your loved ones, but I, I commend you for what you've done. I, I did want to say this uh, with respect to whether this is serious or not, and, you know, I'm not going to look in people's hearts and try and judge uh, the motives for whether these hearings are, you know, serious or not or, you know, what's behind them. But I'll say this. We've got Republican colleagues who've introduced legislation to uh, eliminate the ATF, um, eliminate the FBI, um, Mr. Trump called for defunding the Department of Justice and the FBI. As a former federal prosecutor, I, I can tell you that if you get rid of those three agencies, there's no federal mechanism or arm to actually prosecute uh, violent crime at the federal level. That means terrorism. That means gangs. Uh, that means multi-state issues. The big takedown of um, the Sinaloa cartel on Friday I think was a, the reason we were able to do that was because we had a strong federal government that was able to cross federal lines and international lines and, and complete those prosecutions. So I certainly oppose the defund the federal law enforcement arms that we've, we've had discussions about. And with respect to the funding in general, I think even at the local level, the federal government can and has been helpful and should be more helpful, too, from a funding standpoint. I, I think there's, it's right we can't really meddle in local prosecutions per se, but uh, funding for victims' rights, for resources, for training, for hiring and retention police officers, because I know police departments are competing now for a shortage of officers. So I think it's important for us to try and step in in that way. But I would encourage uh, my colleagues on the other side to speak about the specific types of proposals they would put forward uh, at the federal level to address the local crime issues that you're talking about here today, because I haven't heard any so far. With that, I'll yield the, the, the remainder of my time to Mr. Goldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ivey. Mr. Borgen, I understand uh, that your son was the victim of an anti-Semitic attack. Uh, and I'm terribly sorry to hear this. Uh, Anti-Semitism hits all of us, uh, regardless of party. 
And now, now that we have recently learned that uh, George Santos, who not only remains in Congress but is announcing his reelection campaign today, uh, is not actually Jewish, uh, the ranking member and I are the only Jewish members from the entire state of New York. And we are deeply concerned about anti-Semitism in New York, which has increased more than 400 percent in the past eight years. Now, today we've already heard two members of the majority reference what one called the Sorosization of criminal justice, the criminal justice system, which is, of course, a reference to George Soros, a Holocaust survivor who lived the American dream. Many more have said the same. My constituents are very concerned that these smears related to Mr. Soros-supported uh, prosecutors are anti-Semitic. Do you believe they're anti-Semitic? Well, here's my answer to that. I don't know if Soros is Jewish. He can't be anti-Semitic. I, I can't believe that, especially – No, what people out. say when they use Soros. Soros. Soros politics, he's just a liberal, lefty politician. I don't think he has nothing to do with what his beliefs are. He, want, he, what he wants to create – whatever he wants to create, it's his business. All right. I, I appreciate I, that. I, I, I think you're – but Mark, I don't have a lot of time, and I'm no, sorry. I think Mark Levine, who just got elected from Lower Manhattan, got a, a, a petition signed with 29 signatures – protesting this conference. I don't know if you're right. aware of it. Can I, can I just reclaim my time because I only have Sorry. 20 seconds. Okay. And I want to mention that when I was walking in here today, there was a man outside with a sign. And I would just like to hold this sign up. You saw it, right? There's a Star of David with two dollar signs and Soros. Would you say that's anti-Semitic? That's 100 percent anti-Semitic and it's disgusting. Right. It's disgusting. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to echo the comments from Mr. Holden. Uh, your allegiance is to your constituents. Each one of us is here because of our constituents. Our allegiance is to our constituents as well. My constituents live in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Uh, feels about as far away from New York City sometimes as you can get. Uh, the floor that I was on in my hotel last night was taller than any building in my entire home county, uh, Botetourt County. But uh, our hearts are with the people of New York City. Our hearts are with the victims of these crimes that are being committed against the people of New York City. And every crime has a victim, and every – and it's not just about numbers. It's about real people, as Mr. Tiffany was saying. And we are hearing some of the stories, and I want to thank you all for being brave to come here and share your stories with us. Uh, we're grateful to you. But my constituents are scared because they're watching what's happening in New York City, and they know that uh, the Shenandoah Valley – if they adopt the wrong policies, if they elect the wrong prosecutors, their lives could uh, turn for the worse, and their cities and counties could be uh, full of crime as well. And the policies that have been adopted in New York City are policies that were just uh, adopted in Virginia uh, when Democrats took over the House and Senate and the governor's mansion between, two th between 2019 and 2021. Um, they abolished parole. Or, they reversed policies that were put in place in 1995 that abolished parole, instituted mandatory minimum sentences, and presumptions against bail. Those are all gone now. And we're worried, quite frankly, in Virginia uh, because we see uh, the impact of those policies here in New York along with uh, the falling apart of what I consider to be a three-legged stool when it comes to uh, the fight against crime. You need three legs of a stool. You need uh, police who are going to arrest, you need prosecutors who are going to prosecute, and you need judges who are going to put people in jail. And uh, here in New York, uh, you don't have those three legs. I'll let you decide how many legs you have and how strong those are. But when you get rid of the policies that, uh, like a presumption against bail that we got rid of in Virginia, uh, like the bail policies that you have here, the ending of cash bail, uh, here in New York City. It's like termites eating away at that stool. So no matter how strong you have in, in terms of your, your mayor who's a former police chief or your police chief now, uh, if, if you lose those legs or if you have uh, the stool being eaten away, uh, you see the spike in crime that's happened. And we have a spike in crime here in New York City. Uh, 1,500 rapes up 7 percent, robberies up 26 percent, felony assaults up 13 percent, burglaries up 23 percent, grand larcenies up 26 percent, auto thefts up 32 percent, all accounting for a 23 percent increase in major crimes in just the last year. So we do have a uh, – you have a problem in New York, one that uh, we're, we're afraid could spread to other 
places like uh, my area of Virginia. You know, we talked about the use of taxpayer dollars, and Ms. Brame, you uh, talked about the lack of services that you received. And so we inquired about uh, how many taxpayer dollars uh, go to New York City and to Alvin Bragg's office. Uh, the DA's office receives $204,730 in federal grant money during the current award period uh, from the Department of Justice's Justice Assistance Grant Program, which is subgranted to the City of New York, goes toward addressing violent and other felony crimes in our jurisdiction. Uh, more interestingly, and more to your point, the DA's office received $583,111 in federal grant money yearly uh, this past year from the Victims of Crime Victim and Witness Assistance Grant Program, which is subgranted through the New York State Office of Victim Services. Uh, use of these funds is to be used to provide information to victims and their families related to the prosecution of cases and assisting victims with understanding the criminal justice system. Uh, over half a million dollars sitting in Alvin Bragg's office to help people like you. Do you feel like you got help from Alvin Bragg as the case was going forward? No, I, I received no help from his office. I was, me and my family, we were treated like garbage. You know, I, I can't describe it any more than, you know, what I have already. You know, it, it was the most horrific experience that I've ever experienced. It, it was just bad. Were you, you alerted nothing. when the plea deals were cut for two of those uh, mm -hmm. offenders? Were you alerted to those plea deals when they were cut? No. Were you allowed to put uh, a victim's uh, statement into Not, the not for Mary Saunders. Not upon her sentencing. For Travis Stewart, I did, um, and for the, the other two. But um, they, they dismissed those gang assault and those murder indictments um, behind my back. That's abhorrent and yeah. uh, did not do justice to you or to the son that you lost. And not at all. Apologize. Not at all. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Before we recognize the gentleman from New York, I, I, I see we're joined by one of our other colleagues, the gentlelady from, uh, from here in New York City. Staten Island, Ms. Malley Takas, thank you for joining us and, and for your concern about what's happening here. We now recognize, pursuant to the agreement reached with uh, Mr. Nadler's staff, the gentleman from New York, for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, and thank you, Mr. Johnson, for giving me some previous time. I want to continue uh, my, my previous statement. Uh, back in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, uh, this was a tough town. It was tough to live here. Crime was really very violent, and as I said earlier, during that period, I had the opportunity to work for a victim services agency, providing services for crime victims. And I was also the president of the 34th Precinct Community Council. Uh, and, I, and if that's one thing that I really learned during that, that, those two decades, was that you cannot really simply take, talk about crime without talking about guns. You just can't do it, because 80% of the homicides are committed by guns. Now, we're not minimizing the other 20%. They're also equally important. But 80% are committed by guns. This past Easter Sunday, a young man gets shot and killed on 137th Street, not too far where Mr. Alba used to work. Why? A gun. Just this weekend in Alabama, just this weekend, this Saturday, four people shot and killed with what? A gun. A shooter in a Louisville bank kills five people with who? With what? With a gun. The horrific elementary school shooting in Tennessee that left six people killed, including three children, with what? With a gun. Some of my colleagues, after that shooting, wore their AR-15 pins on their lapels and tie clips. I think mocking the death of those innocent kids. So a gun is the common denominator in eight out of ten homicides. How can we take that away? We cannot do that. We must continue to fight for common sense gun law. And you know why? I'll ask you all that are here today. You want to find out why guns are not being talked about? Follow the money. Follow the money. Go into each and every one of our campaign accounts and figure out who's getting money from the Air NRA. Just follow the money. That's a, a phrase that's usually used on a common basis here in New York City. Very simple. Yeah. Who is the NRA supporting? Gentlemen, so, 
gentleman's time has expired. The, the, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Fry, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing today in one of the most iconic cities in the world, New York City. I want to especially thank the witnesses, the victims, for your bravery today. It is not easy to come here to talk about this in the public square, but thank you uh, for doing that. Uh, when people think of the United States, they think of this city, as was talked about earlier. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. But underneath all of those twinkling lights, something is not right in New York City. Shootings in Times Square, robberies in broad daylight, stabbings on the subway. I got into a cab yesterday, and the gentleman who ha was driving had been doing it for 25 years. And without knowing who I was or why I was here, he proceeded to talk about the city. And he said, this city has changed. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he immediately started talking about the crime. It's gotten so bad, it's out of control. This, unfortunately, is what we get in Joe Biden's America and Alvin Bragg's New York City. To the good people of New York, we hear you. We are here in New York today because we want to hear from you, and we hope that your local leaders start to listen to you as well. When the hearing was first noticed, the district attorney uh, release a statement that we were coming to the end, I quote, safest big city in America, and that this hearing was a political stunt. You want to know the real political stunt? Politicians in New York and other places continually pushing failed policies despite knowing that they don't work. Let's talk about this for a second. According to the New York Police Department, in Alvin Bragg's first year in public office in 2022, rapes are up 7%, felony assaults were of rose 13 percent, robbery spiked 26 percent, burglaries are up 23 percent, grand larceny is up 26 percent, auto theft has risen 32 percent, 170,000 felonies in New York City in 2022 alone, the most since 2006. Does that sound like the safest big city in America? I think not. The question is why? New York State eliminated cash bail for most crimes, tying the hands of judges and law enforcement. Alvin Bragg's day one memo, which outlined his office's position that he would not prosecute certain types of crimes. In addition, rather than approach each case on the facts of the offense committed, his office is focused on how much money you make, your circumstances, or your immigration status before deciding whether to charge a crime. And of course, as was already talked about, defunding $1 billion out of the New York Police Department's budget. 52% of felony charges are downgraded to misdemeanors in, di in this district attorney's office, the highest number in years. The felonies of the felonies they actually decide to prosecute, his office was only successful in securing the conviction on 50% of those, the lowest number in years. On misdemeanors, 29% of misdemeanor charges resulted in, uh, in conviction. If you listen to the district attorney, he sounds and acts more like a public defender than a prosecutor. If you want to defend criminals, be a public defender. If you want to change policy, run for the state assembly. Instead of partnering with the New York Police Department to prosecute these crimes, he seems hostile. It's no wonder that officers in the New York Police Department are resigning at a record rate. According to a recent article by the New York Post, there is a 117% increase in cops resigning in 2022 alone. That's the most since right after 9-11. Regarding New York's bail law, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice found that approximately 72% of violent felony offenders who were released without bail were rearrested. Recidivism is so bad in New York that 327 individuals were arrested for more than 6,000 crimes of retail theft. That's not giving somebody a second chance. That's letting them do the same thing over and over again to about 20 times and still letting them off the hook. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Maybe the 21st time they'll wake up. Mm -hmm. From an interview in January, District Attorney Bragg said he knows what's going on in the streets. Does he? It doesn't sound like it. Ms. Brame, I want to start with you and, and to the other victims. Who benefits more in this city, law-abiding citizens or criminals? Can you repeat that, please? Who benefits more in this city, law-abiding citizens or criminals? Oh, absolutely criminals, 100%. Ms. Harrison? Criminals. Mr. Borgen? Same Unfortun question. Unfortunately, it's the criminals who are getting all the, the perks. Ms. Brame, have you spoken to the district attorney about your son's case? Absolutely not. No response. If you could speak to him today about it, what would you say? <laughs> I would um, demand that he reopen that uh, gang assault and that murder case against Mary Saunders and Travis Stewart. If no one is above the law, prove it. Prove it by prosecuting them. Bring that case to trial.
Thank you for your time today, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Brame, you said um, earlier that you are only hearing about Donald Trump from one side and not the other. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that that's very, very intentional because they know that they are using taxpayer money to defend a private citizen in his own criminal investigation and that that is an abuse of their power. The day before this investigation began, public reporting revealed that Donald Trump and his legal team directed House Republicans to initiate an investigation into Alvin Bragg. And they're now scrambling to justify this investigation with after-the-fact explanations, including the preposterous explanation that he spent $5,000 of federal money on this years-long investigation. They have spent many multiples of that amount of money on this hearing alone in order to hold it in Manhattan. Now, I've asked the chairman and other members of House leadership to tell the American public what kind of collusion they have been doing with Donald Trump to use the power of this committee and of this Congress to interfere in this prosecution. They have thus far refused. But we will learn about that collusion because the Manhattan District Attorney has a lawsuit against the chairman and they will be able to compel disclosure of the communication and coordination as part of that lawsuit. But that's why we are here, and that's what we want to emphasize to you. And we're not insulting you. Your, your experiences are devastating. But the problem is, is that this is a charade to cover up for an abuse of power that they are going around talking incessantly outside of this hearing about Donald Trump. And the purpose of this hearing is to cover up for what they know to be an inappropriate investigation. Now, I look forward, many of you are Can I in respond New York to City. You, please? No, not right now, because I only have 20 seconds. I'm sorry. But I, I do want to Don't insult talk. my intelligence. That, I, I, you're hang not on, hang on. The gentleman's time. I'm not insulting okay. You're trying to insult me time. like I'm not aware of Ms. what's going Ms. on Brain. here. Thank you. Okay? I, I'm to fully the... aware of what's going on here. Gentlemen, I will suspend. Okay? Gentlemen, gets another 15 seconds. Thank you. That's time why left. I walked away from the plantation of the Democratic Party. Committee will be in order. Ms. Brain, what, what I was about to say is that as a representative of this city, I look forward to working with you, with Ms. Harrison, Mr. Holden, Mr. Borgen, all of you who are involved and engaged in our criminal justice system. Because, as I said and my colleagues have referenced, gentlemen, time we has do expired. have a problem gentlemen's not only time. in New York City but around the country. Gentlemen's time so hopefully expired. we can gentlemen work together back. to make, reach real solutions, not gentlelady, charades gentlelady like from, this. Uh, gentlelady gentlelady from New York, Ms. Devonick is recognized for five minutes. Mm -hmm. As a native New Yorker born and bred, uh, I think it's important to note that many of the Democrats on this committee have smeared brave victims and fellow New Yorkers here today, calling them props, a circus, a performance, MAGA Broadway pops, and an underlying sham. What have Republicans focused on? We've focused on giving victims a voice. We've focused on crimes. We've focused on your story as a father, visiting your son at the hospital, seeing his face beaten in with an anti-Semitic hate crime. We're focused, Ms. Brame, on your story as a mother, grieving the loss, rightfully grieving the loss, and advocating on behalf of your son and his legacy. Ms. Harrison, we heard your story about losing your loved one. And Mr. Alba, we heard your story just the personal challenges you've faced dealing with the consequences of the vicious crime committed, perpetrated against you. And in addition to House Democrats belittling the victims here today, Democrats have politicized this hearing, mentioning Donald Trump 38 times. That number for Republicans is zero. We are focused on victims and making sure that we support law and order in this country. There is a catastrophic crime crisis across America, specifically in our great cities and great cities like New York. New Yorkers know it, Americans know it. And while Democrats on this committee may claim that New York is not the epicenter, look no further than the last November election where we flipped four congressional seats delivering the House majority. What was the number one issue? It was crime because voters are smart, the people are smart. Mr. DiGiacomo, as a member, as a longtime member of law enforcement, I wanted to get your testimony today. How long have you served in law enforcement? 
Uh, approximately 40 years. And in those 40 years, would you say the crime crisis today is worse than you've ever seen it? That's correct. Crime is up. Is it fair to say that it is a result of failed bail reform policies in Albany and Alvin Bragg's day one memo? 100%. And here are some important numbers. In 2022, District Attorney Bragg's first year as DA, New York City saw a 23% surge in major crimes. Is that true? That's correct. From 2019 to 2022, murders are up 93%. That's correct. From 2019 to 2022, robberies are up 43%. Correct. Felony assaults are up 32%. Correct. And it's fair to say that law enforcement strongly opposed Bragg's day one memo and failed bail reform policies in Albany. 100%. Mr. Giacomo, in fact, you have said, quote, Bragg gives criminals the roadmap to freedom from prosecution and control of our streets. In Bragg's Manhattan, you can arrest, deal drugs, obstruct arrest, and even carry a gun to get away with it. Can you please expound about why law enforcement opposes Alvin Bragg's day one policy and opposes failed bail reform? Well, because, again, uh, every time a detective or a police officer uh, puts himself in or herself in harm's way, arresting a felon or anyone for any crime, uh, they're released immediately with no consequences. Mr. Borgen, as a family member of a victim of a heinous violent crime, your son, as you talked about, was a victim of a violent anti-Semitic hate crime committed at a pro-Israel event. Your son was jumped, beaten, and sprayed with mace. In fact, and I think it's important for the American people and my colleagues across the aisle to hear this, your son describes this as, a whole crowd of people proceeded to kick me, punch me, beat me down. I felt a liquid being poured on my face, and at first I thought I was getting urinated on, but it turned out I was getting maced and pepper sprayed. My face was on fire. That pain was worse than the concussion and all this other stuff that followed. And yet the attacker, the attacker said, if I could do it again, I would do it again. And yet, District Attorney Alvin Bragg gave him a sweetheart deal. What is your message to District Attorney Alvin Bragg? Well, the man is incompetent, obviously, in the big scheme, the big scheme of things. But unfortunately, you know, our hands are tied. He, he, he can come to us. If you, he offered him other deals. My son did not accept them. Um, right now, the court case is pending and different deals are passing on from back and forth. But, you know, between me and you, I lost, I lost faith in the justice system with Alvin Bragg. I don't feel anything's going to get done. Like in the other cases also, uh, her son's attack is walking around scot-free like nothing happened. It's a disgrace. And I just want to say to you, Mr. Ivey, I compliment you. You're the only one who sat here on the Democratic side, didn't bring up Donald Trump. And, I, and you're a mensch. You, you talk straight. You didn't, you didn't look to make partisan politics here. I want to compliment you. Ms. Harrison, what's your message to Alvin Bragg? I'm a walking example of not ever being whole 18 years after losing a loved one under horrific circumstances and not seeing justice. My life will never ever be complete without Kevin and knowing that his fam the murderer's families are walking free, spending Christmases and Easter's with their family is it, it, it's beyond comprehension. So I hope that he will pay attention to what's happening here today and realize the effect that he's having on survivors of homicide victims for the rest of their lives. Thank you to the victims for the bravery sharing your stories. Thank you to our former law enforcement officers for your leadership. Yield back. General Lee yields back just to the witnesses. We ha now we'll just be on this side. I think we've, the Democrats have all went. Um, it's about 40 more minutes. If you've got to step out, just please let us know. But we want every member to get a chance to talk to, to you. If you need to step out, please just excuse yourself. And Capitol Police, make sure you know where, where you're going out there. With that, I yield to the gentleman from – five minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. I thank the chairman. Um, much has been made about why we are in New York City. Um, in a memorable moment shortly before he was elected, former Mayor Rudolph Giuliani told an editorial board meeting he cared about statistics, but the real measure would be whether people actually feel safer. That, he said, was the ultimate test of policing and political leadership. He said that in 1993 when, the New, York, when New York was averaging 2,000 murders a year. By 2013, it was down to 333 due to the uh, strong support of law enforcement and the anti-crime policies adopted by the city. Got down to 288 by 2018, but now it is back up to the mid-400s. I think this is the question, is whether or not you feel safe. And the question I'd ask of Ms. Brain, Ms. Harrison, others, do you feel safe in New York City right now? No. Yeah. Mr. Alba, do you feel safe in New York City? Right. 
And uh, Mr. Giac- Giac- Giacomo, uh, your history in law enforcement, you said it's as safe as unsafe as you've ever seen it today in New York. Yes, that's correct. And isn't that the ultimate measure? Isn't that the question? And I think one of the things that I think merits um, focusing on is the question that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been talking about in terms of jurisdiction. What is the jurisdiction here? Mr. Giacomo, are you familiar with 922G and 924C in the federal code? No, I'm not. I'm sorry. 922G being felons in possession, 924C being the ability to be able to go after somebody and give them a heightened sentencing for their use of firearms and crimes. And my question here, we might suspend. The committee will suspend. The, the gentleman is, is recognized <laughs> to continue. All right, so we're back on. Uh, 922G and 924C, these are federal crimes, right? And they're federal crimes that we have programs like Project Safe Neighborhoods that work with local law enforcement where we have the United States Attorney's Office in coordination to try to combat crime and the use of firearms in crimes. Now, I suppose we could go through and look at the laundry list of legislation that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have introduced to repeal said federal laws that these federal laws should not exist. Now, if we want to have a debate about federalism about that, happy to have it. But we're not doing that, are we? Because that's not what this is about. It's about show. The fact is we do have federal laws on the books to go after criminal uh, misuse of firearms, but they're not being enforced. And they're also not being enforced at the local level. Those are the facts. And the facts are we are letting criminals out of jail. If you look at the data, the data is clear of Uh, The average criminal has 11 prior arrests, five criminal convictions. 77% have five plus. Can the crowd to be quiet, please? Thank you. Five plus prior arrests. 74% have prior violent arrests. 30% have prior arrests for guns and weapon offenses. Even though these individuals have lengthy criminal records, records, 52% served a year or less. 60% are rearrested within two years of release. The fact is we have a recidivism problem. And we have now gone down the road of decarceration. Hundreds of thousands of criminals have been released. Just since 2020, the incarcerated population is down about 300,000. When it was 2.1 million, which by the way, was pretty far down from the levels when we had the safest numbers in the safest streets in the city. But this isn't about some libertarian worldview of letting out a few potheads who are allegedly rotting in jail. 88% of prisoners are incarcerated in the state systems for murder, rape, robbery, and assault. It's responsible for most of those sentences. A mere 14% are in custody primarily for narcotics offenses, and the vast majority of these are felony trafficking crimes and misdemeanor possession. My question is for you, Mr. Giacomo, is do you think that we have a problem uh, with uh, – the gun issue, or do you think we have a problem with letting criminals out on the streets? Well, we are, the criminals are being let out at an alarming rate. And I just want to make it clear here that the, the guns, I'm speaking for New York City, the guns that are being used here in New York City are illegal guns. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're illegal guns that are, that are uh, brought here into New York City and being used uh, to victimize the people. And are they being prosecuted heavily by the DA here? No, they're not. Right. And isn't that the problem? That is a major problem. And are they being prosecuted in coordination with the United States Attorney's Office using 922G, 922G and 924C to prosecute? Not that I'm aware of, no. Right. And isn't that fundamentally the problem? Correct. Um, question I have, my colleagues on the side of aisle have mentioned former President Trump a number of times. I would just ask, was it former President Trump, Ms. Brame, that killed your son? No. Ms. Harrison, was it former President Trump that killed your loved ones? No. Was it former President Trump that stabbed Mr. Alba? No. Was it former President Trump that prosecuted Mr. Alba and prosecuted him for defending himself? No. No. I yield back. The chair recognizes the representative from Texas, Mr. Niels. Thank you, Chairwoman. (coughs) All right. Check, check. As a uh, former law enforcement officer for 30 years, 
sheriff of a large county in the great state of Texas. What I've seen happening in our country is disturbing and should be a concern to all of us. Crime is at an all-time high. The American people can't trust, can't trust their government. And the left wants to defund the police because law enforcement shootings where police acted inappropriately, and those officers were rightly charged and sentenced. What we saw in 2020 with riots, rioting across our country, led to numerous attacks on law enforcement and citizens with hundreds of millions of dollars in damage to buildings. The left will rally their troops, they'll rally them, they'll get them all together in the name of social justice, but little is being made of the hundreds, the hundreds of victims of crime in Chicago and New York and other large cities run by liberals because the victims and suspects of those crimes are predominantly black, and in those cases, black lives don't matter. Right. They don't matter. Shame on them. Mm. And the dishonest media. The dishonest media is the greatest threat, folks. You in the back. You are the greatest threat to this country. And we've seen it, and the American people know it. Most people on the left, if not in this room, you've heard of Eric Gardner. I'm sure you've heard of him. You've heard of George Floyd. You've heard of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown. You've heard of all those names. But what about the hundreds of innocent victims in Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore? You'll never hear their name. You'll never hear their name. Shameful. If you've watched the news lately, it's no shocker. Alvin Bragg likes to prosecute. He's even a fan of increasing misdemeanors to felonies for certain individuals he don't like. Some of those individuals, he said, he's the greatest danger to our country. Mr. Bragg, I hope you're watching. I hope you're watching today, sir. You're a disgrace. You're a danger to this country, and I will do everything I can in my power to hold you accountable. Your job, Mr. Bragg, is to protect the residents here in Manhattan and decreasing felonies to misdemeanors, decreasing felonies to misdemeanors and is dangerous and places the victim last. Mr. Kessler, I'll start with you. You work for Senator Schumer and other members on crime policy, that's great. So I wanna get your perspective on this day one memo. You're familiar? Uh, you familiar with this? I am not. You're not familiar with this day one memo and you come here today? I should provide you a copy. According to the D Manhattan DA, the aim of the day one memo is to reduce Manhattan's over incarceration issue and to deliver safety and fairness for all. And so I ask you, you're, familiar, you're not familiar with the memo. The day one memo stated the DA's office will not prosecute minor offenses that, quote, have no, have no impact on public safety, end quote. So let's talk about some of the things Alvin Bragg considers minor offenses. Resisting arrest. Can you tell me how not prosecuting this makes New York safer? Resisting arrest. I'd have to say We're not going to prosecute it in New okay. York. We're not going to do it. All right. We're not going to do it. Did you ever ask law enforcement? Mr. Giangio, how do you feel about that? How do your law enforcement officers feel about not prosecuting resisting arrest? They weren't happy about it. That's well, you wonder why 1,400 officers left New York PD in 2022. Why in the hell would you work here? I'd go out into the suburbs where you have, you can go out there and fight crime and be respected. You're not getting that in these large cities such as Manhattan. You want to defund NYPD a billion dollars in 2020 and you wonder why we are in the state of emergency we are in. Mr. Bragg laid out five sections of law that covers armed robberies and says New York will not prosecute them. In short, according to this memo, if you hold a gun to a clerk's face and ask, empty the trash, empty the, the cash register, sir, we are going to take that and that's going to be a misdemeanor, no big deal. That's no big deal. How do you feel about that, Mr. Kessler? What if I come over there and I put a, my pistol and screw it in your ear and I don't say anything bad to you and we're just going to say, Mr. Niles, that's just a misdemeanor here in the great state of New York. Well, that has happened to me. Well, sad, isn't it? How would you feel about that? I was pretty scared. Pretty scared. Yes. But we're going to consider that a misdemeanor here in the great in, in, in New York. It's unacceptable. It's disgraceful. 
and I wish I had more time. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes the uh, congressman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> pretrial release decisions. New York State law requires an annual report of pretrial release decisions made by New York City courts. Uh, the latest data released in September of 2022 shows that statistics of pretrial release granted to individuals across all categories of offense between 2019 and 2021. Here's a few takeaways from that. Uh, since New York City repealed cash bail for certain nonviolent felonies in 2019, the instances of imposing bail have decreased across all categories of offense, including violent felonies. Release was granted in more than 75% of nonviolent felony cases in 2021. And of those released, 40% went on to commit another crime within 180 days, uh -huh. with 10% of those being violent uh, felonies. Uh -huh. In those cases where bail was actually set, which in 2020, 2021 was about 12,000 cases, more than 3,700 of those had bail set at $1. Um, I wanted to highlight those statistics for a couple of reasons. The first is to show that weak bail policies in New York City do, in fact, have an effect on violent crime. Thousands of violent felony offenders are being released under their own reconnaissance, or in some cases, like I said, for a dollar. And then within six months, are back in front of the same judge. And then the second is to say that the pretrial release statistics play an important role in helping the public, and Congress actually, understand whether a state's bail policies are contributing to a spike in violent crime. So I ask this, and I ask Congress, that we should take up a bill, bill that we've worked on in past Congresses, and the Pretrial Release Reporting Act, so we can see how other state bail policies are contributing to really an epidemic that's nationwide right now. So, uh, Ms. Harrison, I was I was going to ask you, can you just comment, kind of in general, on pretrial release statistics and and the issues related to that? not just in New York, but nationwide. I mean, as you mentioned, we see it across the board all over the news that people are killed or victimized by people that are released under pretrial, uh, uh, you know, least restrictive conditions, bail reform, cashless bail, whatever you want to call it. We have over 305 people that are dead in New York because of bail reform. Um, Christina Lee was murdered here in New York by somebody that was on supervised release, uh, which really is non-existent. So across the board, across the country, it, it's awful, and it's victimized. People. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, um, I just wanted to get your opinion on how these type of pretrial decisions erodes the relationship between uh, law enforcement and the district attorney's office. Well, I've always remembered the police and the district attorney's office work together uh, to help the victims of crime. Uh, I don't see that happening in Manhattan and it's, it's caused more people to die. It's got to be disheartening for officers on the street to go out, do their job on a daily basis, make the arrests, do the right thing, put their lives at stake, and then find out on the back end that the DEA didn't follow through on either prosecuting or at the end of the day, kind of a slap in the face when you find out that they were released on a $1 decision. Well, absolutely, and like I said earlier, every time you uh, engage uh, the criminal element, you're putting your life in harm's way. Very good. Thank you. I think. Yep. Yep. I yield to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you. Uh, when I think of victims of crime, being a sheriff, having to deal with it pretty much all my life, and I think about an individual having to protect himself. And, and when you have some type of a knucklehead, we got one over here on this poster board. Mr. Alba, you have to deal with this. This guy's in your face. I felt, you felt scared, didn't you? Did you feel this guy was going to possibly kill you? Maybe cause serious bodily injury, if not death? Then you have a right, you have a right as an American citizen to use deadly force, sir, and eliminate that threat. You have a right to do that. Everybody in this room would agree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, when will is the gentleman it okay yield for one minute? For when a second, it? sir? Will you yield over here? When is it, when can we look at, if somebody puts a knife to you or a clerk at a cashier anywhere in this country, 
and he's threatening to say, I'm going to kill you, you don't give your money, I would encourage your residents in the great state of Texas and my county to defend yourself. Defend yourself. You are given that God-given right. And that means pulling out a weapon and put two at center mass. You'll reduce recidivism, won't you? And you won't have a repeat offender. Gentlemen, time has expired. The gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Sparks, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was <laughs> always, I'm the other person that always believed that um, the greatest of our country is the freedoms and greatness of our people. And someone who came from a communist country, it appalled me what's happened in our country. And I said that, unfortunately, Congress became a circus and charade. Unfortunately, what's happened in your district is also a circuit and charade. And I appreciate people being here, Mr. Alba, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Bray, mm -hmm. uh, and actually sharing your personal story. And I apologize on the behalf of the Congress. I also appreciate Mr. Holden sitting here and actually willing to challenge your own party. I actually do it quite a lot. And a lot of people in your party don't have that strength. And I hope we can see more of that. You know, I, on the way here, uh, one of my um, constituents texted me. We had police officer suicide. We had police officer killed um, in the district last year. We have a serious problem with our criminal justice system. Our government is set up to protect people's rights to life, liberty, and property, and it's not doing it. People play in politics, and it is one of the core functions, and this committee has that function. So I appreciate Mr. Chairman actually having field hearing. I should appreciate my Democrat colleagues showed up this time because I hope we'll do more. Because the city of Indianapolis has higher murder rates than the city of Chicago. And we have a Democrat prosecutor. He is not enforcing the crime, you know, the laws. And the problem is what we have right now, and I actually agree with Mr. Goldman and Lofgren about jurisdiction. It's a challenge. I want to hear what we can do, what we shouldn't be doing, and I hope we'll have more discussion about jurisdiction because we're overreaching significantly on the state's rights. And a former state senator, I have a huge problem with that. I also agree with, you know, at least appreciate Mr. Ivis said, you know what, it's all about gun control. At least he's honest, okay? Not like do all these talking points, like I was listening to TV this morning. They already say, oh, committee came about talking about all the break. I honestly don't give about him. I actually care what is happening in this country. And I think it's important for us to hear from we the people because people are not heard in D.C. There is no lobby for the people in Washington, D.C. So hopefully you start being more active in that. I also think, you know, Mr. Aspiat said follow the money. I actually would like to follow the money. Why are we not dealing with hospital monopolies that Chuck Schumer is supporting so much? Why are we not dealing with a border situation that all those NGOs get money? Who knows what the hell they're doing with that? And why we have the crisis with all those situations? But I want to try to ask you. You know, if we want to find common ground, I actually, on the criminal justice subcommittee, tried to do some pass some laws on a bipartisan basis. But is there is any in your party except gun control? I know that Ms. Fisher, you mentioned about, you know, the, the safe storage and everything. I just don't see anything how my, how I am and my kids are going to be safer if I lock up my guns. I just feel, actually, as a female, I feel not as safe. And I don't know how long overwhelmed police officers will take them now to get to help us. So I think we now, it's really strange for me, we try to take, you know, protection from law-abiding citizens and believe that criminals are not going to get gun. I mean, there is anything else except gun control. Maybe we should reform education and have some wraparound preventive services and have more competition in education that these kids actually taught some values that don't have a 10% or 8% literacy rate that they have to get into gangs. Is there anything else you can say except gun control? So comprehensive solutions to reducing violence in New York City have actually been incredibly effective. And that's yeah, why like, if, I set the, if I set the record straight, because we've been talking a lot about statistics, uh -huh. the NYPD's own data has shown that shootings are down well, in the first quarter, 19%. It doesn't sound like Homicides you have also, are down 9%. Okay, Mr. Kessler, my, my question for you. You've been talking a lot about trafficking and, you know, I'm going to be talking about child trafficking, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and the border cartels actually doing what this gun violence associated with them. Can we find common ground on that? Well, let me try to. I mean, is cartel not a problem? Can you tell me the trafficking of guns done by Mexican cartels that now we're subsidized with taxpayers' money? Is it not a problem? Can we find a common ground on that? Perhaps. If, if I but let, let, let's talk about that. I mean, why cannot we talk about that? If I, if I could just have 30 seconds to okay. answer. 
Well, I don't have so many seconds, but. Back in the Wayback Machine, I helped with Chuck Schumer worked on the 1994 crime bill, which I know not everybody loves, but one of the things about that crime, it was a huge, it was comprehensive, it was one of the things that brought down crime in this country, but one of the most important things about that crime bill, Schumer gets a lot of credit for it, Henry Hyde, the Republican ranking member, worked on it closely with Schumer, too. It was a bipartisan effort, and solutions was taken but, from both sides. And but let's talk about perfect, it, but, but we crime, right now not do it. My, my time is expired, but we need to stop playing politics with people's lives. I yield back. Yeah. General Lee yields back. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Uh, Moore, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me say first, I, I appreciate you having this hearing. And let me set the record straight for the people in New York. This is not the first hearing on crime we've had since Mr. Jordan's been chairman. A few weeks ago, we went to Yuma, Arizona. We, 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 we saw where people were coming across the border. You know, 106 different nations, 107,000 fit in all this. We talk about mass shootings. We only had 74 people killed by mass shootings last year in America. We're losing more than that today and just in this hearing along to fentanyl poisoning. So we've been out here, and we're going to go to other areas where there's crime, and we're going to have hearings because it's a concern. I mean, Victoria's right. We have to begin to address these issues that are threatening American citizens. And so, Ms. Brame, you actually took one of my talking points a while ago. Crime, the, the criminal does not differentiate between a Republican and a Democrat. You know, I was stabbed a few years ago, and I was glad the DA actually charged the man for attempted murder and put him behind bars. It made us all feel a little safer. And so thank you for being here. Ms. Harrison, thank you for being here. Mr. Alba, thank you for being here. And, and Mr. DiGiacomo, I want to talk to you a little bit about just what we're seeing with the, the rules the DA came in with, this, this new rules, this set of rules. And uh, are you seeing officers retire now and go into other lines of work as a result of the policies? Well, I lost uh, 600 detectives re retired uh, this year alone. Uh, just to give a, a clear consensus on what that means, in 2001, in the terrorist attacks, we had 7,500 detectives. Right now, I'm working with 5,400 detectives. And we're doing more investigative steps now than we were done then because of the um, video canvases. And we're also doing counterterrorism duties as well here in New York City. What do you think the primary reason the, 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 the detectives, you're losing that experience level, why are they leaving? Well, you know, when you're a detective, you investigate crimes, and sometimes it takes months uh, to investigate those crimes, and there are reports that are this high, uh, and the detective puts many, many hours and days and weeks sometimes investigating those crimes uh, just for the individual to be let go, and they're getting frustrated, and they are frustrated is the real uh, and, fact. And I guess they risk these lives that they're investigating these crimes as well, and always, they risk always, their health. Yes, always. You know, New York City detectives uh, do any, everything from patrol uh, to climb the bridges and everything in between, homicide, special victims, uh, narcotics divisions. So uh, detectives uh, and all police officers here in New York City do very dangerous work uh, 24 hours a day. Mr. Giacomo, i got a question. You know, I find it interesting that when a law enforcement officer uses a weapon to defend himself or, or even in pursuit of a criminal, mm. it's always the law enforcement officer's fault. But when it's the criminal using the gun, it's always the gun's fault. How do we address that in, in society? Why does the left always drive that narrative? Well, it's very, it's very simple. It's the person that is handling the gun. It's the criminal element that's using the gun and victimizing other people here in New York City and across this country. So it, in some sense, it must be the person, the individual responsible, not the law enforcement officer well, himself. 100%. How do you find a man that, or a lady that wants to be law enforcement officer if she pulls her weapon in a life-threatening situation and she shoots somebody, she's going to be tried for murder or he's going to be tried for some sort of crime, but if he doesn't pull his weapon, he ends up dying. How do you recruit people to go into that industry? It's a dying profession. That, that's, you know, it's scary for me, for, for our society in general, if we yeah. cannot recruit good law enforcement officers and they're crucified by the left and the mm -hmm. media when they act to save themselves or their partners' lives. Well, and if I may, yes, please. Uh, there's, there's no uh, no profession, at least here in New York City, that has more oversight than the New York City Police Department. Mm -hmm. There are about ten levels of oversight, uh, and no one else has that level of oversight uh, like the New York City Police Department. And, you know, it's, it's typically in society, and, and this is for, you know, all folks in blue cities or any other cities, you know, often they want to disarm law-abiding citizens. And they say, well, call the police. 
if you, if, if you have an intruder, call the police. And then at the same time, they're defunding the police. What kind of situation, Ms. Harrison, does that put society in when you, you can't defend yourself? A horrible situation. And at the same time, in, in the name of ending mass incarceration, as they like to gaslight everybody with, they're releasing very violent recidivists with no oversight because they're removing any kind of parole supervision, bail supervision. So we really, we do need to be, be able to defend ourselves in some way, shape, or form. Is that weapon, I mean, my daughters have concealed carry permits. It, is it, it's the equalizer, correct? For a lady who's being attacked by an assailant who's much bigger, much heavier, much stronger, does it not equalize the playing field? I, I believe it does. Thank you. With that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, witnesses, we just got a few more, but these are very important members, uh, great, great people, and we're going to go now with the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for being here. Um, I represent the state of Wyoming. There are 560,000 people in my state. I grew up outside of a town of 350 people. I currently live in our largest city of 60,000 people. I want you to know Mr. Alba, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Brame, Mr. Bergen. We pay a lot of attention to what goes on here. Mm -hmm. We know about you. When I read about your situation, Mr. Alba, and what happened to you the next day after it happened, I prayed for you. I prayed for your family. As I read the testimony that you have provided to us today, it makes my heart break to know that you as family members have gone through something so devastating. But to make it even worse, our criminal justice system has treated you as so poorly since that you have gone through these things. I will tell you, it has been interesting to listen to you talk about your loved ones, talk about the fear that you faced with this situation, Mr. Alba, the loss that you're still suffering from 18 years later after losing your loved one, how much love you have for your son, how much love you have for your son and your family and your community. And I do want you to know that we're not here for grandstanding. We're not here for anything other than the fact that we're recognizing that across the country, there is a sickness pervading our communities that is destroying who and what we are. And it's not just about guns. I watched you, Ms. Fisher, as you secretly smiled at some of the, uh, the, the Congress members on the other side, as people on our side talked about the, the gun issue. Uh, I, I, I understand you believe that it is an inanimate object that somehow can, can create the, or cause the, 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 the mass shootings, that it's not the individual. One of the things that has struck me today is that as we talk about these mass shootings, nobody has talked about the drugs that these people were on. Nobody has talked about the psychology of this. We just had a woman in uh, shoot and kill three young children and three teachers, and yet no one has talked about what kind of drugs she may have been taking, what kind of psychosis she was suffering from. Clearly she was suffering from a psychosis. She claimed that she was a boy when she was a girl. We have to be looking at those kinds of things. It's not the guns. It's what we're teaching in school. It's the rot in our culture. It is the fact that we are losing our society because we're unwilling to recognize that there is evil, and when there's evil, we need to address it. When someone does something to your family members that is illegal, we need to take them off the streets. We don't need to try to figure out uh, what, what may have happened in their background. If they've done something, if they've stabbed a beautiful young man as they did your son, they need to be taken off the street, and they need to be punished. We need to protect our law-abiding citizens, and we need to protect our communities. We also need to protect our, our police officers. Um, Mr. Uh, DiGiacomo, the thing that has struck me as I listen to the testimony is the fear that I have, and you were just speaking with it a moment ago uh, with my colleague, Mr. Moore, about the impact that this is having on our, on our law enforcement officers, and you said something that was extremely jarring, which is it's a dying, it, it's a dying profession. And what that means is we're heading toward anarchy and lawlessness. When I was driving in last night from the airport, what struck me as I drove down the streets of this city that I love, I've spent a lot of time in New York City. Coming from Wyoming, I love this city. But what I started seeing out the window was almost an escape from New York feel. We don't want our big cities to die. We don't want to lose the culture that we have here. We in Wyoming love New York. We love Portland. We love Austin, Texas. We love these places. They're part of our culture and the fabric of our society. 
But we have to address the fact that there are people who are willing to kill and stab and hurt other people. And it is the responsibility of our law enforcement and our prosecutors to make sure that they can't hurt anyone else. With that, I want to tell you there have been many times today that you've been called victims, and I don't see you as victims. I see you as very, very brave, brave mm -hmm. people awesome. for Billy being willing to come in here today and tell your story and make sure that everybody in this country knows your names and knows the names of your family members. Well With said. that, I yield back. Well said. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hunt, is recognized. I cannot... Thank you all enough for being here. Thank you for sharing your lives with us. Thank you for sharing your stories. I greatly appreciate it and being from Texas. It's an honor to be in your presence. Uh, in, in the 90s, the late, mid to late 90s, uh, New York City was considered one of the safest cities in America. Uh, when I was at West Point from 2000 through 2004, I took that train down here many, many, many a day. Had a pretty good time in this city, and I felt relatively safe when I did just that. But while Alvin, while Alvin Bragg is a Manhattan district attorney, his policies are not isolated to this borough. His pro-criminal policies are just an example of what Soros-funded district attorneys are implementing across our great nation. Their ideology is responsible for the death, rape, and robbery of innocent people across America, and it is disproportionately impacting poor black and brown people. In Democrat run cities across America, criminals are given deference and victims are left to fend for themselves, as you have articulated today. Why do these Soros funded district attorneys put criminals first and victims last? It's what they believe, it's who they are. Our cities are crumbling around us, criminals are running rampant. And that's because district attorneys in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and even my home city of Houston are advocating for pro criminal policies. And Alvin Bragg fits this profile in my humble opinion. Let's talk about Alvin Bragg. He's a woke, progressive district attorney with no different than any other progressive DA in our country right now. He was elected as a Manhattan DA in 2021. His policies should not be surprising given that he was heavily supported by Black Lives Matters PAC that was directly funded by George Soros. In fact, George Soros donated $1 million to that PAC less than a week after endorsing Bragg. Under the guise of helping people of color, he causes them more harm with his pro-criminal policies. Since Bragg has taken office, New York City residents are worried about increasing threats of violence. Do you know who doesn't have to worry about violence? Alvin Bragg. Bragg is surrounded by men with guns every single day. But if you're a regular New Yorker coming home late at night on the subway, you may be robbed, stabbed, raped, or even pushed in front of a train. Do you know what the fastest growing demographic of gun ownership is in America? Black women. Black women. Why? Because they know they have to protect themselves in Democrat-run cities where criminals are allowed to roam free. That is a fact. Now, many of my colleagues on the left like to say that our justice system is two-tiered, that it favors the powerful and connected at the expense of poor people of color. But in Bragg's office, there's a two-tiered justice system. It's criminals first and victims second, especially victims of color. We have an opportunity to vote out DAs just like this, to make people that look like me and you, ma'am, safer. Let me take it one step further. Not just people that look like you and me. Every single American that lives in this country should feel safe to live in their own streets. End of discussion. I'm sitting here right now, and I'm hearing Trump, 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 Trump. And at the end of the day, the people that are sitting here right now, they don't want to hear that. The only thing you want is safety. We are not grandstanding. I am not grandstanding. I can assure you I would love to be holding my four-month-old boy right now. But I am here to fight for you and to hear your stories and to allow you to tell your stories. And for that, I am forever grateful. And ma'am, you ain't the only one that's, that's actually left the uh, plantation. It's happening all over the country. <laughs> and with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Kiley is recognized for five minutes.
In recent years, we have seen a movement to fundamentally change America's approach to law and order by defunding police departments and by putting so-called progressive prosecutors in district attorney's offices. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, you are the head of the uh, New York Detectives Endowment Association. Uh, what connection do you see between these two things, defund the police and progressive prosecutors? Well, you know, uh, they're, they're following uh, the progressive line and not backing the police, not uh, caring about the victims, and uh, putting the criminal element back out onto the street to victimize the people of, uh, of this uh, city and state and country. That's right. Both seek to eliminate or neutralize uh, the capabilities of law enforcement, correct? Uh, well, it's, it's been compromised already. That's right. And thereby removing or reducing the consequences of criminal activity, correct? Mm, correct. So these policies have uh, gained a major foothold in several cities, including uh, the one that we're in right now. So we can assess what the impact has been. And one way to assess that impact, of course, is looking at the effect on crime rates. Uh, now, Mr. Holden, you're an elected uh, city council member uh, in New York, a uh, member of the Democratic uh, Party, and uh, you testified today about failed progressive policies. So just to be clear, when you say these are failed progressive policies, uh, is that because they've caused crime to go up or to go down? Uh, again, uh, I'm a critic of, of my party's stance on, on crime. It, everything's gone up. All their policies have led to an increase in crime. And, and I think we saw it come to a head with um, the war on police that, that started after George Floyd, and it went national. And so you saw this kind of crime wave go throughout the entire country. That's right. And in fact, if you look at uh, yesterday's New York Times, uh, it reported that major crime in New York this year is 45 percent up from two years ago. This is from the New York Times. And to your point, in Los Angeles, violent crime is 86 percent higher than the national average. In San Francisco, overall crime is 111 percent higher than the national average. So you can also then look to assess the impact uh, of these policies uh, how, about how people are responding to them. Uh, would you say, Council uh, Member Holden, that these failed progressive policies have caused more people to move to New York City or to move away from New York City? Certainly away from New York City. I've never seen it this bad. Like I said, I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s in New York, and I saw horrific crime numbers, but now it's much, much worse because it's all over. The, the, the lawlessness mayhem is all over. And in fact, uh, the state of New York is second in the nation in terms of one-way U-Haul and rentals, people who are leaving. Uh, first place, of course, is California now, uh, three years running. Uh, Los Angeles County, where George Gascon is the district attorney, accounts for half the people leaving California. And San Francisco, its population is declining faster than any major city in U.S. history. Now, a final way we can assess the impact of these policies is by the judgment of voters. Uh, Councilmember Holden, would you say that, uh, mayoral, uh, that Mayor Eric Adams uh, made the issue of crime a, success, a plank in his, major plank in his successful campaign for mayor? Well, th that was and, and, and certainly is, but he's not getting much support from his colleagues. Correct. And in Los Angeles, uh, George Gascon has been subject to a vote of no confidence by 36 different city councils within his jurisdiction. And San Francisco voters went so far as to recall their pro progressive prosecutor from office overwhelmingly. Now, this is not a red city. The Trump-Pence ticket got 12 percent in San Francisco, and yet voters overwhelmingly recalled that progressive prosecutor. And so the verdict is very clear that these policies have led to crime skyrocketing, to people fleeing, and they're being rejected by voters. And yet today, on the other side of the table, we have by and large saw members of Congress standing by those policies. And for folks who are watching, and for that matter, the victims and the families who are here today, it must be disheartening. But I'd say it's actually not as bleak as it sounds, that in fact the voices that we have heard today on the other side are not representative. And for proof of that, just look what happened in D.C. after the city council there passed a reckless crime bill. In the House majority, we passed legislation to undo what the D.C. city council had done. President Biden signed with us and signed that bill. Two out of three Democrat senators sided with us and voted for that bill. Do you know how many members of this committee on, in the minority voted for that bill? Just one. Every single other member voted to keep the reckless pro-criminal 
DC crime bill in place. So I would say there's a lot more consensus in this country right now than today's hearing uh, makes out, uh, and that the pendulum is swinging back towards supporting victims, supporting law enforcement, supporting law and order, and I look forward to working with people of good faith on both sides of the aisle to restore sanity to our criminal justice system. Gentlemen's time's expired. Mr. Brands, recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the great, there's a greatness in America that has often been reflected over the history of our nation by the greatness in some of our largest cities, like New York City, like Philadelphia, like a couple cities in my state, Austin and Houston, to name a few. But widespread movements in these cities to focus support for criminals instead of victims, to put progressive liberal politics ahead of the lives of all individuals, regardless of political affiliation, to put sound bites ahead of sound policy, and to focus on social justice rather than actual justice have resulted in these Democrat-run city, cities, like New York City, being less safe. Of course, if you're talking about the safety and protection of criminals, that's different. Mr. Jim, uh, Gi uh, Giacomo, uh, let me see if I understand a couple of statistics correctly, and I'll ask you a couple questions about this. When it relates to uh, Alvin Bragg's Manhattan District Attorney's Office, not even going back before that, but just looking at what he's done and looking at the process in particular. Let's start with somebody that's committed a, crim a criminal offense, a felony offense. Since 2019, after, if you compare 2019 to 2022 statistics, Alvin Bragg has declined to prosecute 35% less felonies than before. But even with those felonies that were charged, He's downgraded 52% of those felonies down to misdemeanors. And even when you get past that, of those felonies that actually make it to trial, Alvin Bragg's office is only successful in about half of those cases. So when you start doing the mathematical calculations, if you're a criminal in this city that commits a felony, by the time he declines to prosecute and then downgrades a portion of that what's left and then actually prosecutes those that are left and is unsuccessful in about half of those cases, probably only one in five at best, maybe one in six or one in seven that commit a felony criminal offense in the city of New York City and in the Manhattan district in particular actually get convicted of that felony conviction. Is well, that true? That's counterproductive to, uh, to the victims of crime. Correct. And once convicted then, based on Alvin Bragg's day one memo, He's encouraged l less and less of those criminals to actually receive jail time. Isn't that true? That's correct. Now, how, do, how does that work with the morale of the NYPD? Well, we're seeing it now where we're having, uh, you know, so many members of the NYPD leaving uh, for other departments and detectives with years and years of experience and knowledge uh, retiring. Uh, it's going to have a major impact on public safety here in New York City. Yeah, does it actually affect their ability to perform their duties? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, if, again, uh, if you're not prosecuting the crime, uh, you know, again, you're putting your life on the line every time you encounter uh, a criminal or a criminal element, and just for this individual to be let out again, and all your work was done for no, for no reason. I'd like to know what you're hearing because you have your ear to the ground. Ground. What are you hearing from the men and women, the brave men and women of the NYPD, about their desire to continue to serve under these kind of circumstances? It's, it's policing here in New York City is the most difficult I've seen it in 40 years. It's it's almost impossible for the, these young cops and old uh, and detectives to do their job effectively because you don't have a, a, a clear understanding and working relationship with the district attorney. And how does it affect their job and their ability to perform their job that about half of those actually charged with felonies are out on, without any bail at all, awaiting trial, and only about half are in? Well, it breaks the morale, of, and it breaks your desire uh, to serve and protect the people of the city. Do you see oftentimes when uh, these that have committed felonies that are awaiting uh, trial are actually out there committing more felonies while they're in their pretrial state? Well, that's the sad part about this. They're out again victimizing the people of the city. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's why uh, the morale in the NYPD is so low right now. One of the things that you mentioned in your testimony, your written testimony, is about juvenile offenders. Mm -hmm. Talk about juvenile offenders under Alvin Bragg's uh, district attorney's office, whether or not they're committing more crimes, whether or not they are incentivized to be part of gangs more than they were before. 
Well, it used to be 2% of the crimes in New York City. It's now double digits. And uh, they're committing more crimes, uh, carrying more firearms because they know there are no consequences. Yeah, and these are the illegal firearms that we've been talking about so Correct. much that Alvin Bragg's office has decided not to prosecute under existing law. Is that true? That's correct. All right. Thank you for your time. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentleman yields back. Last but certainly not least, my friend and colleague, the gentleman from New Jersey, is recognized. Hi. You guys got to be tired. Um, I know after a while you can you know, almost have your eyes glaze over. I want to tell you, and I really mean this, and, I, and I, there's a lot of people in this room who mean it. We appreciate you. We appreciate your bravery, your strength, your love for the ones that you lost. We appreciate the professionals who are here who are willing to speak up against all odds. This is a big deal. And without folks like you, without good Americans like you, without individuals who have the courage and strength to stand up the way that you do, we're definitely doomed. And I also want to promise you something else, and I think the chairman will, 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 would stick with me on this, and I think the members here would stick with it. We're going to do something. We absolutely didn't do this for an exercise. We absolutely didn't do this for politics. So I, I do want to say this to, to my friends on the other side. You know, um, they threw out all kinds of stuff today, numbers that weren't real, a whole discussion of guns. You can have a lot of discussions on guns, but that wasn't what today was about. It wasn't a discussion about the guns. It was discussion about Alvin Bragg. They talked about George Santos, anti-Semitism, Donald Trump, money going from the NRA to members, which, by the way, I don't think it does, or else I'm surely the only one not getting it. But I asked a few people. I don't think that's accurate either. That's an old political trick. Just so that you all who are sitting here at this table know, you put the shiny object up here. The shiny object is Donald Trump. So hopefully you, you hope that you all and that we all get so focused on his issues and get drawn into that. I don't give a damn about his issues right now. We'll deal with his issues and their important issues at another time. I care about your issues. We care about your issues. They should care about your issues, not all this other crap they threw out there. And I'm sorry, I'm a little rough around the edges sometimes, but I'm just telling you the truth. It's about time we hear the truth, and that's what the truth is. And the truth is this. I did write some things down, too, that crime rates in our biggest cities have risen to staggering levels. You know, when you say the crime rate or what's really going on, you can't just talk about somebody who is actually been prosecuted, was going to be prosecuted, but was released. That's why these numbers look down, because we're releasing everybody. We're not putting them in jail. Bad people should go in jail. That's where they belong. They shouldn't be out so they can hurt your wives, your children, your mothers, your fathers, your grandfathers. We want to be safe. And it doesn't matter if we're, you know, what color, what race, what origin we are. We want to be safe in our homes. You know, I think of what goes on in Chicago. It's not only New York. My God, how many little black babies get shot every single week in that town? And we can stop it. We can stop it if we had good prosecutors. And who's funding these progressive district attorneys? We should know that. Well, it's George Soros. With this increase in crime, you would think their DA would be actively trying to slow it down. He's not. He's taking money from George Soros. No, I don't know any but money from the NRA, but I'll tell you, there's tons of money, tens of millions. In fact, he spent $170 million. That's a lot of dough. $170 million in 2022 and $40 million, which was for local prosecutor elections. We never had money spent like that on prosecutor elections, and it's wrong. Prosecutors should run because they want to defend the law, help their police, and most of all, help you. God bless you after being a victim and losing people you love that you're here. I can't believe how strong you are. And the beg the, you know what begs a question, too? Who's worse? Is it a prosecutor who doesn't enforce the law or the criminal? Well, you know, the prosecutor who doesn't enforce the law has a broad effect across mm -hmm. the whole city and Good should point. know better and is taking his position 
that position of such importance to be the legal guardian, to be the person that's the caretaker of our America, of our cities, of this great city of New York. And what does he do for politics? He doesn't care. The fact that he didn't sit down and shed some tears with you. It's unbelievable to me. The fact that he put you and accused you of murder. Troy was right before. A man tries to kill you, you've got to stop him. It's your right. But I guess he would have rather that you got killed. I don't understand it. And it's in New York City, it's in Chicago, it's in San Francisco. And this is the facts. Ah, oh, shoot. I had a few more seconds. A few more. Um, the, the bottom line is the facts are that all the Soros back district attorneys are doing this everywhere. It leads to more crime. And I'm going to say this I'm going to finish up. Gentlemen. And I think the answer is I think he should resign. I swear to God he should resign and he should be disbarred. Gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen, time has uh, expired. I want to, uh, th this concludes our, our hearing today. I want to thank our witnesses. I've been in, I've been in Congress a while, um, not quite as long as Mr. Nadler, but I've been there a while. And I don't know if I've ever had, we've, I've ever been a part of a hearing with more powerful witnesses telling your story. So thank you for your courage. Thank you for your patience, uh, for being here. Uh, God bless you all. And that can, uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Now, without objection, the hearing is adjourned. I, I thank the witnesses.